and I'm recording. So I want to welcome Erev Tov Lekulam. It is it's really nice to see you all, so many members of our community. For those who want to share your faces, we would love to see your beautiful, shining, smiley faces on the screen. So uh, it'd be great if you want to open up your screens as an opportunity for us to, uh, to be together as a, as a community uh, on Zoom, um, fighting back against... Uh, that's the restrictions that we have in the way that we can, and um, by being together. So, so it's good to see you all, Erev Tov Lekulam. I want to thank Dr. Danny Daniel King for being with us this evening. And I also want to thank uh, Efrat Railbrook for setting this, uh, this event up. So if you see Efrat, please thank Efrat for, for putting this together. It was her yuzma, her, uh, her initiative. And uh, we're very uh, privileged to have uh, Dr. King with us this evening. And um, what we're gonna do is as follows. We're gonna split this into two parts. I'm just gonna have a short interview in the beginning so that we can learn a little bit about Dr. King's background and the work that he does. And then we're gonna open up the floor. And the, the point of this session is for you to be able to ask Dr. King any questions that you have about the virus, about its production, about it, um, about how, it, how it's being administered. And, uh, and so, so get your questions ready. And uh, this is an opportunity to have these to have these discussions, and uh, and to speak to to the medical experts in the in the field. So let's start with uh, question number one. You know, Dr. King, tell us a little bit about, you know, what do you do? Tell us about your uh, what your current work is like. First of all, good evening, and again, thank you, Rabbi Ben David, and thank you, Efrat, for giving me this opportunity to address all of you. Um, I am. Uh, medical doctor. I work at Mayer Medical Center. That's most of what I do. I work in the pulmonary department. I have uh, specialized in pulmonary and critical care, and we actually have a uh, both a pulmonary department, which is very active with about 35 patients admitted. And uh, we also have a small, medium-sized critical care unit um, originally only for pulmonary patients, but recently it has become the medical ICU and over the past nine, 10 months has become the Corona intensive care unit of the uh, Mayo Medical, uh, Medical Center. Uh, mm -hmm. And most of my work is uh, in these two departments, either in the pulmonary department or in uh, the intensive care unit. When we first opened the Corona unit, in uh, May, which was uh, about, around about Purim last year. So I, uh, I was responsible for it. I managed it for about a month. Um, since then, it has opened and uh, closed for a few times, and we are actually probably going to reopen the pulmonary department at the Corona unit uh, in the next few days with an increased number of patients. Um, except for uh, working in Mayer, I also work, work in uh, Maccabi and I actually see a few um, uh, friendly faces and uh, everybody knows me as a pulmonary doctor in Maccabi. Can you raise your hand if you're Dr. King's favorite patient? Can, can you raise your hand? <laughs> yeah, uh, there are quite a few favorite patients. Um, uh, and uh, so I work one afternoon in Maccabi in Ranana, in Ranana actually. And uh, and that's uh, how I spend my time. I do a bit of miluim. Some of you have been uh, attended the, the talk last year about uh, medical uh, airborne evacuation, both um, in the army and uh, and. Um, well, well, t tell us, what do you do in the army? What did you do in the army when you served, and what are you doing now in miluim? Uh, well, uh, as I served as a uh, actually my uh, uh, service as a, before I went to medical school was for a, was a, an instructor, a communication instructor in the Air Force. And I spent six years in medical school, then I did a few years as Miluim, as an um, infantry doctor, did most of my work in Yudav Shomron, mainly in the area of, uh, of uh, Elon More and uh, Shavei Shomron. And for the past ooh, eight, nine years, I've been a uh, uh, doctor in uh, the medical evacuation unit, uh, airborne medical evacuation unit, Cheshire Station, 669, and uh, spent about a month a year, the four weeks. Um, that's another subject, another talk. Mm -hmm. and, and tell us a little bit about your training as a doctor. So I studied in uh, cell medicine in, in Beersheva. 
from mm -hmm. 91 to 98 and I did my internship and my medical residency there in Dar Sheva mm -hmm. and as a supervision of uh, the late uh, professor, professor Shaul Sukenik, great mentor. Uh, then I traveled to the United States. I was there from 2005 to 2008 at the University of Maryland Medical Center. I did pulmonary and critical care. Came back for another year in Soroka in Be'er Sheva and spent the next seven years in uh, Ramba Medical Center uh, doing mostly intensive care. Um, got a bit far away from my pulmonary uh, work and I wanted to try to combine them and that's what I'm actually doing now at Mayo where I can combine both pulmonary work and critical care work and very, very convenient and good for me professionally mm -hmm. to be able to combine these two fields. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow, thank you for, for sharing all this, this all this personal information. And and so you opened up, helped to open the first Corona uh, yeah. care center at, uh, at Mayer Hospital. Now it, it yeah. almost feels like eons ago. This is the third Seger and that was the, that was the first Seger. And you know, what would you say, what have we learned you know, since, since then? What was it like having to open this up versus now, you know, what, what have you guys learned in the field? It's, it's amazing. The, the things have changed. Um, just as a reminder, when we opened up um, just before Purim, so we actually, every patient who had COVID was admitted to a hospital. You could not be in at your home with COVID. So we would have patients come with suitcases, feeling absolutely fine, completely asymptomatic and spending the time there. We actually have some screenshots. We, we, we monitored them with, with, uh, with um, closed uh, circuit televisions and we have screenshots of people sitting down and having a nice game of poker, having a glass of whiskey. It was really very different, but I think after a couple of weeks, maybe even less, we started getting patients who were really sick. And very quickly we started having ventilated patients and patients critically ill, and unfortunately patient dying as well. So we also learned what kind of medications work, but mostly what kind of medications don't work. Um, and uh, we went for a few, through a few phases of, of different treatments. Um, we know today that people can be at home. We know today that people can get different uh, uh, treatments at home. And we also know that we need to uh, admit some patients, especially the patients who are requiring oxygen um, in order to give them better treatment and be, on, be there if, if they, uh, God forbid, deteriorate. So things have changed from being a hotel to being a very, very sick patient unit, unfortunately. Wow, wow. very, I, I, I can't imagine how hard, how hard it's been these last nine months dealing with this. I mean, how have you, what is it like for you every time you go into the ward and, you know, what is that like as a doctor knowing that you're, you know, you're putting yourself at risk when you're treating your patients and helping other people? So uh, it's common knowledge almost now that I actually got sick and after a month of uh, treating patients. Um, it's not exactly clear where exactly I contracted it, but I was doing a lot of procedures and spending a lot of time in the hospital. So me and another few staff members got sick. So I, I actually feel pretty confident walking in onto the unit. Mm -hmm. um, most of, the, patient, most of the, the staff members that actually contracted COVID we're pretty sure that they contracted it outside the ward. So when we go into the ward, we're pretty well protected. We have protection gear, and I'll show you some pictures later on. So, so that's pretty safe. Um, I think that, that, that the more troubling thing is that, that um, we know for a fact, sorry, that, that some of these patients uh, are not going to make it, especially the older ones, but not, not necessarily. And, and that's troubling because you walk onto the ward and you want to help patients and sometimes mm -hmm. it's, difficult. it's very difficult to see patients taken away from their families. We, do a, a, we try very much to allow family members to gown up and go into the ward and spend some time with their loved ones. We also have some volunteers who, who are, have, uh, uh, have been cured from the disease and they also come in and do some volunteer work and sit with patients and talk to them because the loneliness, even though you know you have all these technological uh, ways of contacting patient, people on the outside, it's not very 
it's not very personal. Hmm. And some of the older folks aren't very familiar and don't really manage them. So having people come in and sit down and talk to them, and, and actually when I'm on the ward, I, that, that part of what I do is sit down, talk to the patients, the nurses do the same. Everybody on the staff knows that it's difficult to be far away and they spend their time hmm. talking to these patients. Wow, wow, really, really special to hear how much you try to meet your patients' needs, both uh, medically, but also emotionally and psychologically. Really, really important. Um, okay, so you, from what I understand, you have a little presentation to share with us. Yes, I do. I hope it will work. About the vaccine. So I hope it will work. Just the floor. Uh, let's see, can you see the screen? Not yet. Not yet, not yet. Hold on, we'll manage, sorry. See, even I have some uh, technical issues. Here we go. Okay, how about now? Yes. Okay. So um, the qu big question is, when will we find this, when will we find the silver bullet? We'll be able to to put all this COVID nineteen issue behind us. And I'll try to answer a few of the questions when I, with this presentation, and maybe a few of the questions will, that will come up later on from the, from the audience. Uh, let's see how we do this. Okay, so we know that COVID-19 was discovered about a year ago, and it is going to be here for a long time. It's going to be here definitely for the next few years, maybe some people say even a decade, and maybe forever. It is a deadly and debilitating disease. People, unfortunately, uh, pass away from this disease. Uh, what you're seeing here is us treating a patient in the intensive care unit in Mayo. Um, actually, this patient's been lying on his stomach to help us uh, uh, facilitate the ventilation for this, for this patient. Um, it's, I call it a social disease because if we would, as a society, be better at, uh, at uh, adhering to the recommendations and to the restrictions that we have, we could probably have controlled it better. We can see some countries uh, that manage to, to control the, the spread of the disease better, but actually most countries, even uh, uh, very uh, developed and very uh, uh, strict countries uh, will actually have failed preventing the spread of the virus. These are numbers that I took off the, off the website called the uh, uh, Worldometer just a few hours ago. So we can see that more than 80 million con people contract the disease. We have more than one three quarters of death from the disease. Um, currently, uh, the, um, excuse me just one second, let me get the pointer here. Can you see my uh, my mouse pointing at stuff? It's not important. So we can see that, that about uh, uh, half a percent of the people who have the disease are seriously or critically ill, and the death rate uh, is about at three three percent. But that's probably not very accurate. If we see the numbers here in Israel, which are probably more accurate for the world as well. About 2% are, are seriously ill or critically ill, and the uh, uh, fatality case ratio is about 1%, 0.9%. Um, just so you understand, if today about 5,000 people uh, uh, got COVID, um, 50, 50 of them are not going to survive this disease. So that's a lot of huge numbers. And for all those people, and um, we can refer to them later, people say that COVID is not, an, it's not a real disease and not a real pandemic. This is my answer. The, the, the percentage of fatalities are, are absolutely, absolutely enormous. Um, how about treatment? So there are a lot of drugs that were proposed as a cure for the disease, unfortunately, except for dexamethasone, which is a very simple uh, steroid. None of them have really been very useful in changing the course of disease. And also many medications were, were proposed as um, um, preventing or preventing severe illness. 
um, except for maybe vitamin D, and again, this is just as prevention. I have an I have my own idea about vitamin D. It's not really been wasn't really proven, but except for that, no real medication has been proven to prevent the disease until recently. So uh, before we go on and talk about vaccination, um, what is a virus? So this is out of Monty Python. You see, a virus is what we doctors call very, very small. So small, so it could not possibly really have made off with a whole leg. It's barely alive. Um, we can see here's a life uh, span of the, whatever you want to call the replication of, uh, of the COVID-19 virus. So you can see it here. It has to attach to the cell with a receptor. We know that the receptor in this case is called an ACE2 receptor. Um, also helps control blood pressure. And with, another, with some more assistance, it enters, the, enters the, the cell. Inside, it has uh, some RNA. This is its genome. Our genome is composed of DNA. But the RNA is, um, it, it is, part, is the genome of the, of the virus. And using the host uh, ribosome, which is a manufacturer of, of proteins, it, started, it starts to produce protein, especially a, a, a protein that will help replicate the RNA because human cells cannot replicate RNA. They don't know how to do that. That's one of the reasons that we're talking about, uh, we'll be talking about the messenger RNA vaccine. Human, human cells do not have, know how to replicate RNA. They know how to produce proteins out of the RNA, but by themselves cannot replicate RNA. So after the, 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 the virus uh, RNA has produced this, this, this protein that will replicate the RNA, there's a lot of R RNA in the cell. Some of, the, some of it is, is used in order to form some more proteins that are necessary for the virus replication. And some of them are packed in special uh, 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 subunits and are formed into a new virus, which is then sent out into the, into the, into the uh, plasma of the patient and goes to find other cells in order to infect, or in some cases, will leave the body uh, through uh, body fluids, a sneeze, a cough, and infect other people. Um, during this process of, of the replication, so the, the, the body uh, actually understands that they have something foreign and will attack this cell and eventually destroy it, but causing an inflammation which will cause our disease. So how can we prevent it? There are, these are the five uh, suggested uh, vaccine systems. I don't really want to go through all of them, just so you know that there are about five systems. One of them is what we have now is a DNA or RNA uh, uh, system. And what it does is it, it scientists sequence the RNA, the messenger RNA, that is used in order to produce a certain protein called a spike protein. Um, and they isolated it and produce it in the lab. They don't use viruses for it. So there's no real chance of somebody contracting the virus from the disease. Then they put it in a, in a, in a, in a lipid coating, in an oily coating, and inject it into the body. When it, is inject, when it gets into the cell, um, this messenger RNA will produce only the spike protein. It could not reproduce. The, 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 the human cell cannot make more messenger RNA with, because the body cannot replicate, the human body cannot replicate uh, RNA. It can only replicate DNA. So the only thing that this messenger RNA will do, it will produce proteins that will eventually be sent out to the surface of the cell. The cell will present this to the immune system and antibodies will develop. The antibodies will eventually neutralize the virus uh, if eventually it will uh, enter the body. So what, what's important for me, for you to see is, first of all, the only thing that's being used is a part of the messenger RNA of the virus. So there are no other uh, elements of reproduction or no other um, adjuvant um, treatments that are, or, or materials that are added onto this vaccine. 
It's only the messenger RNA. So this is actually only a small portion of what will happen if you are infected with a virus. If you're infected with a virus, so you get a lot of more uh, RNA and a lot of more production of, of uh, uh, proteins and destruction of the cell. But if you only get the messenger RNA, it will produce the proteins. And it's actually like a small factor of little proteins in your body. Within a week, the messenger RNA, probably less, uh, the, the most of the week, the messenger RNA will degrade and there'll be nothing left for producing these proteins. So I, I want to answer just one of the questions which I, I've been asked many times, and this is how comes the vaccine is available so quickly? It must have shortened, I had some shortcut. So, so that, that is not true because there are a few two things that will restrict the development of any drug and vaccine is special. So first of all is money. If you don't have the money, you cannot develop the drug fast enough. And with uh, Corona, with it killing so many people every day, um, we have no financial restrictions. The amount of money that was poured into this project, into these projects, was limitless. I mean, you wanted it, you got it. So that's one thing. The other thing is that there was no difficulty in recruiting volunteers. Usually when you want to, when you want to try a new drug, you have to have patients who are susceptible to a disease or patients who have a disease, find that they fit, fit exactly the, the, the exact requirements for this study. But with um, Corona, we had the, the people who did studies had no difficulty in recruiting volunteers. They recruited 40,000 volunteers for each study. We're talking about almost uh, 8,000 people recruiting for these just two studies and many more recruiting for new studies. And the study of that's going on in, in, uh, in uh, Britain has recruited another 20 or 40,000 patients. So we're talking about a lot of people being recruited very quickly. And when you have enough people to recruit for the studies and enough money, it makes making a, making a, a, a good study with good robust data very, very easy. Uh, in Hebrew you say, so um, this is me getting the vaccine on the left side. And on the small, the, the, the top picture on the, on the right, you can see uh, my mother, the far left, my sister in the middle, and my uh, niece on the right, all getting the vaccines in Ichilov on the same day. My uh, mother is uh, now she's 87 years old. My sister is 58, and my, and my niece, the young uh, doctor, all doctors, by the way, and uh, my sister and niece still work in Ichilov. So I practice uh, what I do. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a amazing description in Bamidbar about uh, Aaron taking the the, the machta of the ktoret and standing. We we really hope. Uh, I think we all should really hope that this will be the the, the ktoret, the modern day ktoret that will be able to stop this uh, this this uh, this plague this pandemic, because it will continue and continue until we all got it. And um, there will be a percent of, of, of people who will not be able to survive it. And that is a terrible thing to us, putting aside all the financial and, and uh, other issues that we have. So that was my short uh, uh, introduction. Um, uh, I'm open to the questions and so, hopefully- So thank I'll you, Dr. Thank you Dr. Answers. King for the presentation and the Dvar Torah as well. Yeah. You know, I appreciate <laughs> both of them. So, so let's, um, let's open it to the floor. I'm gonna ask everyone if you have questions, please write them into the chat. Okay, that's the best way to do this. Please write in your questions to the chat and, um, and we'll take them uh, you know, one, uh, one by one. I will mention, as you're taking a moment to, to type in your questions, that there's an interesting halachic discussion going on about whether you should say a bracha when you, uh, when you get the vaccine. Um, do you say a shachianu? Do you say the bracha of hatov v'hametiv? Or do you just say a regular, there's a bracha that's mentioned in Masachet Brachot of, actually it's a tefillah, Hashem, that this, this medical uh, intervention should, should help save me, etc. So there is a big discussion. I'm gonna send out a little uh, message tomorrow about uh, what I recommend doing. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Bibi said Shehachiyanu, but uh, not all the posts can agree with him when he, uh, when he, <laughs> he made the bracha, but, but we'll, we'll look at it uh, for tomorrow. So, so I see we have a question from, uh, from Jay. Maybe, maybe he was wearing a new, maybe he was wearing a new shirt. 
a new shirt. That's right. That's right. Yes, sir. Um, okay, who is actually dying of corona? Is it obese people, elderly people, babies? Can you tell us who are the people that are mostly affected? Yeah, so we know that there are risk factors for, for death from corona, and uh, obesity is definitely one of them. Um, but the, 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 the leader of, of the, of the um, uh, causes is, is age. And the older you are, the more chances we are of dying of corona. But it's, it's not necessarily so. There are young people who die of corona. There are young people who are very, very, very sick, being on ECMO for weeks due to corona. And um, in my opinion, you know, a 60-year-old, 65-year-old uh, patient is still young and should not in any way be a, a, a fatality of this disease. So uh, yes, yes uh, obesity, yes, diabetes, yes, renal disease, um, yes, uh, older age. Uh, not so much young children and babies. We do not see that so much. There are a few reports about some inflammatory response post-corona, but actually in Israel, we've seen very, it's been seen very rarely. Um, um, another group that, that we're happy that are not at risk are uh, uh, pregnant uh, uh, okay. women. We have seen that in, for example, in influenza, especially in, in swine flu, the H1N9 uh, uh, flu that we had approximately 11 years ago, uh, it came, to, it came to, to be known. And then we had a lot of pregnant women in very, very difficult diseases. Situation, sorry. Um, today, we're, uh, we, we don't see pregnant women as such uh, ill patients. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. Is there a plan, this is from Jennifer Barbash, is there a plan to test if people have the antibodies after being vaccinated? In other words, if the vaccine has actually worked. So I'm sure there are plans. Um, I am not aware of any at the moment. Um, this has been tested in smaller groups that of the original vaccine uh, studies, and it has been shown that the vaccine produces more antibodies than the disease itself. So we're pretty sure that it will produce antibodies. I think the big question is, A, how long the antibodies will be sustained for, and we think that the answer now is about eight months. You have to understand that the, the disease has been with us for about 11, 10, 11 months. So a lot of these questions have absolutely no answers. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that we, uh, we are building on what's called cellular immunity. Um, antibodies are important, but it's also important that the body remembers the infection. And when it remembers the infection, it can produce antibodies very quickly. We need to go through the whole process of, of remembering. So uh, the cellular immunity, which, which uh, exists in other uh, diseases, is part of what we, we're, we're building on. Um, all in all, um, there are about 200 confirmed cases of reinfection with corona. We're talking worldwide. We saw the number about out of 80 million. So the chances of, of re re getting corona again after you've been uh, exposed or after you've been ill are very, very, very small. And we're hoping that the, the vaccination will give more or less the same uh, uh, prevention, but we, we still don't know how good it's going to be. Mm -hmm. Okay, now a few questions uh, from Madeline Schwartz, Adele Hunter, Joe Schreiber, about the efficacy of the, the second vaccine, the second shot versus the first, sort of, you know, how, and how quickly do you achieve immunity after getting the second, uh, the second shot? So, so the, the, the immunity is achieved after to the first shot, um, the number, the, the official uh, uh, number today is four weeks. Um, so I would not say it's before four weeks you can be uh, immune. However, uh, the four second weeks after shot, the second, the is that four weeks is, after the second, or four weeks after the no, first? No, four weeks. Four weeks after the first shot. Four first weeks shot. after the first shot. We get the second shot three weeks after the first shot. So one week before we achieve all immunity. And this is because the, the, the time period where the protein is presented to the, to the immune system is pretty short. And uh, uh, 
the, the, immune, the, the vaccine is not given with any adjuvant uh, treatment to uh, increase the immune system uh, activity. So that's why they give the second shot in order to remind the system once again and, and get this long, hopefully, long, long term uh, uh, memory in the immune system so it will be able to produce uh, antibodies quickly uh, whenever it will be exposed again. So the importance of the second shot, and again, look, th these are things that, that, that are an ongoing process. Um, it was found that, the, that one shot is probably not good enough to produce a good immune uh, response. It might be, it might be partially, but we know that after two shots, the, the, the prevention of disease is between 95, or severe disease, in 95 and 99%, maybe even 100%, prevention of severe disease. This is amazing. And when you want a vaccine to be safe on the one hand and efficient on the other hand, definitely very, very efficient. And I can say it's also very safe. Hmm. Well, wow. okay, next question from Ruth uh, Sheridan. Um, you know, there are mutations from what we understand that are evolving now in Britain and uh, it's come to Israel and other places. It, will the vaccine work against these uh, mutations? How do we ensure? What happens if there are new mutations that? Uh, that so um, currently, we the, the mutation. Um, what the vaccine does, it produces a protein called the spike protein. It puts it on the surface of the cell, and that what this, the body learns. So the mutations are not in the protein, but rather in the um, RNA, which is part of the virus part of the code for the protein. So the protein is still produced the same way and that's why uh, the scientists think that it will still be very effective even against the mutations. Um, however, if there will be a new mutation that will change the spike protein and still keep the, 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 the virus alive, it's going to be very easy to change the vaccine. All they need to do is change the sequence in the RNA you don't have to retest it. It's like very similar. It's not exactly the same, but it's similar to what they do is every year getting a new flu shot. Do you need to get a new flu shot? So it's very similar. Um, are you still hearing me? Because we have, oh, okay, you're moving. Right, that was uh, turned off for one. So it will be very easy to change the vaccine and make it produce new spike protein and then the, the, the body will be immune. So we might have to get a few additional shots over the next few years, it's still unclear, but the, it's very easy to change the vaccine to produce, to, to um, be able to, to manage the new mutations. Currently, the mutations that exist definitely are covered by the, or not definitely, but almost surely covered, are covered by the vaccine. Mm -hmm. and, and what would you say are the, the chances that this, that this vaccine you know, it doesn't work. Um, as, as a, you know, medical professional, what do you, what do you, you know, where would, would you, would, how much money would you put down in Vegas that this is going to work? You know, is, do you have any doubts about this? Uh, look, I, I, me personally, I can destroy economies of whole countries. You know, um, if I buy a currency of a certain country, it will go down. So I, I don't think that I'm the best person to do this, but uh, we know it works. We know it works. We know on, 30,000 patients on the first, or oh, sorry, about 20,000 patients on the on the Pfizer system, and then another more or less the same amount of patients on the on the Moderna uh, vaccine. We know it prevents a disease, severe disease. That's what we know. What we don't know is we don't know if it actually prevents a patient being uh, um, uh, exposed to the vac to the virus if he can reproduce it and uh, infect other people. So we don't know if it will really absolutely stop it. I think I would I would bet that yes, this has not been uh, properly tested yet, because in order to, to test that, you have to do a, a completely different type of study, which wasn't would have taken much more time. I think that we will see it. Uh, time will tell. But what we can know is that we will be personally uh, protected against this this disease. So again, a personal example, my mother 
Um, because we were sick, I, I think that we're more or less immune to the disease. So she's been spending Shabbatot with us for the past at least seven months. I love having her here, but she's getting fed up with my wife's cooking. So she wants to see my sister-in-law's cooking and she wants to see her grandchildren, other grandchildren without having to wear masks. So this will uh, make it available for her to, to, to actually meet and go out and, and be in public without a very, very significant fear of, of contracting a deadly disease. So this is amazing news for us. And what about people with asthma? Should they receive the vaccine? Will this, um, do they have, will they have a different status after having the vaccine? Um, so people with asthma, as well as other people with respiratory and other chronic diseases should get the vaccine. Uh, depending on the severity of your asthma, um, you can be considered having a chronic illness or not. This has not been really determined yet. Uh, only recently has the age limit of 60 been dropped for, pa for patients with uh, uh, chronic illnesses. So uh, definitely patients with asthma, patients with COPD, patients with other chronic illnesses should accept, should get the vaccine. The only people who should be, who should avoid the vaccine at this point probably are patients who had a severe allergic reaction to a vaccine in the past mm -hmm. because uh, a lot of the vaccines share uh, um, some of the components because the moment you know a component is safe for a vaccine and one vaccine will be safe for a different vaccine. So if a person developed a very, very severe allergic reaction to a component, to, to a different vaccine, they should not have this vaccine. The other the group of people who at this point are advised not to get the vaccine are patients who had a very severe allergic reaction to an unknown uh, cause. And when I talk about very severe allergic reaction, it doesn't mean a, a rash, a rash breaking out, even in all the body. I mean about very severe short of the breath and drop in blood pressure, what's called anaphylaxis. Mm -hmm. And that is a very specific reaction. Um, if you have any doubt, ask your family physician, ask me. Uh, but um, this, is a, this is a very, very small group of patients. So most people should get the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, it's interesting that someone uh, wrote to me today suggesting that the message uh, that, you, that we should be sending out as a community is not that you should go get the vaccine, but that you should speak to your doctor first about whether you should get the vaccine. Do you think that's necessary or do we assume everyone should get it unless you, you're in this unique category of having severe allergic reaction? I think uh, everybody can get it unless you have a severe allergic reaction. Mm -hmm. Um, you have to be very, very chronically ill in order to ask your doctor if it's, if it's advised for you. Um, mm -hmm. I, I really, really, really don't see many reasons why not to have the vaccine. Look, we're here for this question. It's a quick question. It's a quick answer. Um, anybody who walked into my uh, office for the past week or so got an answer about, yes, go and have your vaccine. There was one person who I'm not sure about because she had a severe allergic reaction with a drop in blood pressure about 20 years ago uh, for an unknown cause. So the answer was, look, I don't know, ask an allergy, an, uh, an, uh, allergy specialist. Uh, and she did. Um, but no, you really don't really have to ask your doctor. You just have to go and get it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And... Um... What are the um, what happens if the Maccabi sets you up for the first vaccine but hasn't given you an appointment for the second? Is that wow? Yeah. Uh, Maccabi, I don't know. Or it I doesn't have to be Maccabi. Think... It could be Clali. I'm just curious if this, you know. Yeah, what, it could be what, Clali. What do you, what do you it could do? be anybody. I actually. So first of all, you go and get your first vaccine, and whilst you is there, you say. What's going on with the second vaccine? Um, so um, I, I would go and have my first vaccine and then get the date for the second vaccine. I, even if the second vaccine is a few days late, I don't think it's going to cause any problems. I think we've lost the rabbi. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I hear you. Uh, you're back on? Yeah. Oh. Okay. <laughs> 
So I, I will go and get the first vaccine, and then when I'm on the spot, say, okay, when when is my second second vaccine? Just practical. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm seeing a question here from from Jay uh, to everyone. I'm not sure who that is, but um, Jay asks if healthy people aren't dying of this, why should healthy people vaccinate? First of all, healthy people are dying from it uh, less, but they're still dying from it. Um, and the second, the, the, the second portion of the answer is, it has to do about community. Um, we're still not very sure if the vaccination will help prevent spread of the virus. We think it will. We're not sure. It will definitely shorten the period if somebody is infected, shorten the period of how long he is, is uh, spreading the virus out, out, out there. So um, everybody has... Oh, most people have relatives, older relatives, sick relatives, and even if it's not your relative, there's somebody, uh, a relative or a friend or, or, or something like that. And that, when I went talking about social disease, this is exactly it. We can say, oh, I don't mind for myself. I'm young, I'm healthy, I'll be fine. And you're probably right. But the question is, what will happen if you will infect your friend and the friend has a grandmother or a mother who's sick? This is part, I think, of our responsibility as a community, as our responsibility as as a human uh, as a human being, as a part of the human uh, humankind, we have to help stop this disease. People are dying, so let us uh, help stop this disease. Um, and the vaccination is is there for it. It's a safe vaccine. Um, the virus is much deadlier. And there's nothing the vaccine can do that the virus cannot do. Um, I'll give you a short, a small example, a small example. I have a patient I've been following since she was admitted, I think, in April, maybe late, late March. Um, young woman, 42 years old, used to run marathons, absolutely healthy, no background diseases, nothing. She can now, more than six months after, barely climb a flight of step, stairs. So... She was healthy. She was fine. She's, she's, she, she's very, very sick now. And she's not the only one. I have quite a few of these patients. So um, healthy people can, can get very, very sick. And this is something to avoid. We also don't know today you know, what the late effects of the virus will be in five, 10 years. We don't know how it's going to affect our bodies. Mm -hmm. um, will it hang around? Will this, um, what's called... Um, post-corona syndrome continue uh, will it come back you know go away and come back so uh, we really need to be very very careful and if we can get vaccinated with a safe vaccine this is the time to do it mm -hmm. okay and how do you feel about people who had the dress syndrome getting the vaccine uh, the vaccination Shula's question you know, um Maybe explain so, what that is. Uh, actually, let me see what you can, can you can you yeah. spell it out for me. How do you feel about people who had the dress syndrome? D R E S S. -S, 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 -S. So uh, I really am not sure. I actually have to look that up. So mm -hmm. we'll go to the next question. I'll sort of quickly see what the what the the um, if there are any references for that in the in the in the literature. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, another question from, uh, from Jay. Um, what are the adjuvants, A-D-J-U-V-A-N-T-S? Does the vaccine contain aluminium? Do they know the long-term side effects of this? It has called Bell's palsy in people. Why? Okay, so um, the, as far as I know, there are not many adjuvants in this, uh, in this uh, vaccine. I do not know if it contains aluminium. Um, any inflammatory response can, call, uh, can cause uh, Bell's palsy. Um, it's very, it was a very, very, very rare side effect. This is talking about, about uh, I think, a few hundred thousand people being vaccinated already, and this has been reported maybe once or twice. So, so it's not a very, so it's very rare. So, so what, let's talk about. If we have, um, if we have a, a, a side effect that can affect you one in one thousand, 
we will not know that. We will not know that till we will till we um, have given the vaccine to many many people. But chances of dying from COVID are way higher than one in one thousand, one in one hundred thousand. Uh, in Israel, if you contract it, it's around about one in one hundred. Even in the younger population, it's still more than one in uh, in one thousand. So um, I would, I think. So I took my chances of getting the vaccine and uh, having a chance in one, one in 100,000 complications. Yeah, there will be people who will develop side effects or, which are very rare. Um, no medication can examine that early on. And if they are, they're still very rare. Mm -hmm. So if you ask me, if you have a chance of a viral, virus that kills about 1% of people infected with it compared to a vaccine that will give you a facial uh, um, palsy in, in one in uh, 100,000, I would go for the one in 100,000. Facial palsy. Mm -hmm. But mommy, she got... So, and the other thing is that, that you have to understand that even in the people who were, uh, who got the vaccine, other diseases can still occur. So uh, uh, a Bell's palsy or whatever can still appear accidentally. And we actually know when we look at the death rates uh, that there were deaths during the study, but there were more deaths in the, um, in the placebo group or not less deaths in the placebo group from things that were not, not part of the vaccine. So you can't say that the, the, the two or three patients who unfortunately died from the study group who died from uh, cardiac issues, they actually died due to the vaccine. They died after they got the vaccine, true, but it does not mean necessarily that they had any effect of the vaccine on the, on the, on the unfortunate mm -hmm. death. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you know, I just sort of want to raise the elephant in the room here, if you will. Why is there so much inf misinformation uh, on the internet today about vaccinations and this vaccine in particular. Why is there, what, what is going on in the world today? I know this is, it's connected to your field obviously, but it sort of goes beyond that. I'm just curious to hear your thoughts about uh, what's, what's happening to us as a democratic society, the values, expertise, and truth. What's going on here? That's an interesting <laughs> question. And I've been thinking about it since, uh, since Fat asked me to give this talk. Uh, look, First of all, let's look at the, at, the, at the pandemic itself. There are still people in Israel and worldwide that say that there's no pandemic and people are not dying. This is just, just not true. When you look at the excess mortality rate around the world, we can see an excess mortality rate around the world. We can see, for example, Stockholm, which I have uh, some invested interest because my, my sister lives there. Uh, sorry. Um, so, in Stockholm, the life expectancy has gone down by one year. Um, in New Jersey, uh, one of 500 people died of COVID. Not one, of the five, one out of 500 people were infected. One out of 500 people in New Jersey died from COVID. These are amazing numbers. So, so there is a pandemic, but there still are people out there. Same people will say the vaccine is, is dangerous, that will say, no, there's no pandemic, so why, why treat it? So there is a pandemic, and, and if anybody doesn't believe that there's a pandemic, I can give them the list of the patients we lost um, due to this pandemic. People should have been alive today and, and, and surviving and, 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 and living with their families. So, so there is a pandemic. So then the other question is, um, um, why, is, why is this virus getting such a bad reputation? I think people are not used to getting uh, such a quick uh, result to questions they're asking. And, and this, this, this raises good questions, but the questions are answered. Um, it, it's interesting to see because people were taking, you know, uh, hydroplaquinol, hydro uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine um, for COVID, even though it has not been proven for anything. And actually we know today that it's caused, it causes damage, but they're still taking and saying, oh, we, we managed it. 
The same people saying today is that vitamin C and zinc and vitamin D can uh, treat COVID uh, uh, successfully have no absolutely no proof to it. They, they have not even started to, to show studies to the same uh, extent as the, the, the uh, vaccine is shown. So I think it's very easy to get information out there and it's very easy to doubt a lot of things. Um, it's very difficult to convince people that the establishment is actually doing something good and not trying to harm you. Um, Efrat earlier on sent me a, a video about 30 minutes long videos or video of doctors talking about how bad the vaccine is and stuff like that. So I actually looked into it and, and tried to Google some of the names. And eventually I came up with an article from a guy from South Africa who went through each and every one of the names. And the information about these people is amazing. Um, people who are anarchists, people are treating with, um, they call it traditional medicine, but I think it's very untraditional medicine. I don't think any of the South Africans here would have gone to a Zulu witch doctor and asked for medication for their heart disease. And, and, and these are the people who are presenting how dangerous the virus is now. They send it out, out there, they say pseudo-scientific uh, terms, absolutely unbased. They use outdated research. And uh, if you say it, on television, it must be true, right? So uh, I think that, that, that it's very easy to get misinformation out there, and, and you should you should do what people are doing. You know what? As far as that, if I get the question, should I ask my doctor? Yes, ask a doctor. If you trust him, and this is what's going to convince you to get the vaccine. Ask him what it what it does. Um, Misinformation is, is part of our lives today, and, and, and fake news is part of our lives today. I think the fake news and the people who think that the vaccine is dangerous, or that there's not enough information about it. Um, and I have no doubt, absolutely no doubt, that the virus as a disease can cause much more long-term damage than any part of that vaccine. Thank you. The, um, you know, something that's also interesting is that a lot of the misinformation being sent out about this vaccination is also connected to anti-Semitism. There, there's unfortunately quite a bit of overlap between these, uh, these two things. So we have to understand where some of this information is coming from. I haven't done a statistical study of that, but you see these two things uh, deeply connected. The, the Albert Berla, who's the uh, head of Pfizer, who helped develop the vaccine there. He's, uh, and he's you know, a child of a Holocaust survivor. He's been accused of being a neo-Nazi who's plotting you know, to, to just make money. So, so there's a lot, of, um, you know, a lot of terrible things out there. So, so let's continue with the questions. I just see, um, first of all, Dr. Gary Levy has written here that stress syndrome is, extre is an extremely rare uh, side effect of vaccinations. It is much more common with oral medications. The risk of dress should not stop you getting the, uh, the vaccine. Okay, so a little bit about uh, okay. dress, dress syndrome there. Um, what about teens? Thank you. Okay, <laughs> what, what about what about teens and, and children? Um, you know, do, you, do where do you foresee this going? You know, in another year or two, when they have more information, will we give them the vaccine as well? Do they need the vaccine? Why are we not giving it to them now? I mean, I, I heard in B'nai Brak today actually that they were giving the vaccines to children instead of elders, and they had to close down the clinics there because they wanted the kids to go to school. So um, the, the, this is exactly uh, the, 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 the issue about science. We do not have any information, not have enough uh, data about the um, safety of the disease in, in, uh, in children. It was much more important to get the, the, the vaccine out there for the adults that were dying from the disease and, and, the, and the children who are not dying from the disease. I think that these studies will have to be performed. Um, I think that it's as, as well as the same way that it's safe for, for adults, it will be safe for older children. I don't know what the age group will be. I'm an adult physician, so I don't know how exactly they determine how vaccinations are, are performed for, for studies for vaccinations are performed for children. I'm sure there are a few people out there still remember uh, polio and you know, Salk and Sabin, uh, the developers of the vaccines for polio 
uh, won Nobel Prizes. Um, I can just imagine them today trying to promote the vaccines that will prevent this terrible, terrible disease. They would have had a much worse time. They, they, they had no such data. And this is, these are vaccines that, that save so many people. So I think that the studies of, for children will be performed during this um, close, short time, but it's still not there. The moment we have data, it, uh, it will be out there. And then, yes, again, we'll have, we'll have to, to immunize our children because there will be a pool of virus that will be among the children if we want to prevent this virus to spreading out again and giving us outbreaks and performing mutations that the vaccine is not covering. We will have to vac vaccine our children if maybe we'll be able to to eliminate this virus completely. Mm -hmm. okay. um, just a few more questions here, and we're gonna we're gonna call it the evening. Uh, is it safe to return to the Beit Knesset indoors after you have the uh, the vaccine? Please say yes. Wow. Well, uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I think that I think that this will be a matter of uh, of. Um, Medinut, uh, the word in Hebrew. Um, policy that will have or... to be determined. The policy that, that will have to be determined by the Ministry of Health. Um, I think it will be a bit difficult, you know, who are we letting in, who are we letting out? But there are already uh, discussions about the, the green uh, passport. We'll be uh, able to let you into areas uh, for the, or, or, or shows. I think at the moment that there will be a big enough mass of people who are vaccinated, yes, we will be able to go into, into shuls and start governing in shuls again. Um, I want to tell you that last Friday night was very cold and I'm looking forward to governing inside a shul again. So yes, but it will take time. I think it will take a few more weeks before a definite policy will be established. And, um, you know, People can argue with policies and say that they're right, that they're wrong, but they're still policies. And I think that if we adhere to the policies, one of the problems we have in Israel, and probably around the world is, oh, we know better. So yeah, we may know better, but still we should uh, uh, adhere to the policies because they will help prevent disease if everybody is doing the same, everybody practicing the same policy, chances are that we can control the disease better with and without the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, you know, what about long term? I mean, how do we know? How can we be sure, so sure that there are not going to be long term effects from the vaccine? Yeah. So, so first of all, the the, the the materials used in the vaccine have been used in other vaccines. The method itself, yes, it's new. Um, using the cell itself, the the, the um, building blocks of the cell itself, in order to to produce this protein to be presented to the to the immune system, that's a new method. But it cannot be worse than the virus itself. The virus itself, when it gets into the cell, it will produce a lot of uh, uh, proteins and it will reproduce its RNA itself. The, the vaccine will not reproduce its RNA itself and it will produce only one protein. So it definitely cannot be worse than the uh, virus itself. And we know, we, we see there's, there's a projection. Eventually, um, at some point, most of the population will be uh, exposed to corona. And most of the population either will be infected or even develop some kind, some form of illness. So this will be in our system. I think it's much, much safer to have single strand of RNA that cannot reproduce, that will only give us one protein and have the whole virus that will reproduce its RNA and give us a lot of proteins. And we today do not know all of the long-term long effects. We do know some of the long-term effects. And we know that 40% of individu individuals who had some symptomatic disease still suffer from symptoms to this day. So. It's, it's, it's the virus itself has long-term, very, very severe long-term effects. And um, okay, final final question here from Sylvia Harati. Do you recommend uh, men and women of childbearing age to take the uh, to take the vaccine? 
So currently men, children, men, women of childbearing age do, do, are not part of the vaccine program. Uh, there was a lot of talk about uh, reproductivity due to the vaccine and the spike protein similar to some kind of proteins in the, in the, in the reproduction system. But those, those have been shown to be fake news and, and there is no problem. Of course, we still do not know. If they want, if these people want to postpone it, I don't know, for a few months until it will be available to everybody, it's probably okay to do. Uh, but um, there, we we are being immunized by so many by so many uh, immunizations today, containing all kinds of viruses. Uh, none of them have been shown to show to 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 cause any problem with reproductivity, and. Um, Again, the virus itself will cause much more damage. So if somebody can tell me, look, there's no problem with reproductivity after being infected by the virus, I can promise them that, they, that they, you know, the vaccine will do the same. But um, I would have much more uh, doubt with the virus itself. And we have not seen actually any problem with the virus. but. I would have much more doubt about the, the problem the virus causes in the vaccine, mm -hmm. just because of the way it's built, just because the way it works. Well, okay. Um, the, uh, Dr. King, this has really been an exceptional uh, interview and, and thank you so much for sharing, sharing your wisdom, your insights uh, and uh, your sensitivity. And uh, we really, first of all, we wanna give, let's give a, a clap of uh, hand and clap for Dr. King and for all the doctors and nurses in our community and beyond who are on the front lines. You are the chayalim, you are the ketsinim, the generals in the front lines. And uh, we have so much hakarat uh, tov, you know, for everything that you, that you and your staff and your whole team and the whole hospital, all the doctors and nurses are, you know, who are on the front lines. We really have tremendous hakarat tov, and we want you to know that we we're sending you huge strength and. You should continue to do to do what you're doing to help uh, to help the Jewish people to help our country get through these uh, these times. And we commit as well that as a community, we're going to do what we can to uh, you know to keep people safe and to encourage in a gentle and positive way for everybody to get their uh, get their vaccines and to fight uh, misinformation. So um, so thank you so much for your time. And uh, if you have any other questions, I'm sure Dr. King, you could probably, uh, Dr. King, do you want to maybe just, you know, put in your email if anyone has other questions for you? Uh, I don't mind putting in my email, sure. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, I will try. I'm sometimes a bit swamped with my email, but I'll put it in here in the, in yeah. the chat. Oh, excuse me. So you all have it. Sorry, did I do it to everyone? No, I gave it only privately to somebody. That's it yeah. to everyone. But put in this, if you have any other questions, if you felt uncomfortable me asking some questions, you could continue to reach out to Dr. King or to yeah, any sure. of the medical professionals in our uh, in our community. And Bezrat Hashem, we should, uh, okay, dan danny.a.king at gmail.com. And so you see many yeah. thank yous coming up on the chat as well. So so thank you everybody for participating. Always special to see you all. Let's see some smiling faces before we uh, before we all sign off. Okay, so great to see you all and um, hope everyone's doing well and continue to look at the newsletter. A lot of programs coming up uh, in the future in this uh, coming week. So kol tov, erev tov l'kulam. And uh, you can stay on to schmooze to chat a little bit. Everybody can unmute themselves if you want to just say hi. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Dr. King. You're welcome. Hello. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, thank you Dr. Thank you, Efrat. Thank you again to Efrat Railbook for organizing this evening. Uh, Efrat uh, was very busy today. She couldn't get on, but uh, or at least I don't see her right now. But thank you. So please, you know, make sure to send a message to Efrat to thank her as well. I think we're really I heard, Robert, very you. privileged to be able to have not only participated, but as always, shift day come up, number one, and to have amazing people there thinking of